Good evening, hello and welcome. You're with the news today, your primetime destination news. Newsmakers talking points, our big talking point. October 7th, a year later. A year after the Hamas attack in Israel. How will the war now end? Former Israel Prime Minister Ehud Olmert will be joining me live and exclusive in a short while from now as we bring you both the Israel and the Palestinian perspectives, both sides of that story. But our top story tonight, exactly a year ago, 365 days since Hamas launched the deadliest ever terror attack on Israel, killing more than 1,000 people. Since then, the Israel-Hamas war has now evolved into a multi-front war involving Israel, Iran, Lebanon, Syria and Yemen. Thousands, especially in Gaza, have been killed. A ceasefire seems to be far away from the agenda as a West Asia war widens. All eyes now are on what will Ira Israel's next move be to counter last week's Iran's missile strikes. Our top story is a war one year later. As the clock struck 6.30 a.m. on Monday, roughly the time when Hamas launched the deadliest ever terror attack on Israel, citizens gathered at the music festival site where revelers, nearly 400, were killed in cold blood on October the 7th last year. In Jerusalem, families of the 100 people who are still held hostage by Hamas collected outside Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's residence to observe silence marking the first anniversary of the carnage that left over 1,200 dead and triggered a war that's still raging. Prime Minister Netanyahu's office issued a statement that read, On this day, in this place, and in many places across our country, we remember our dead, our hostages, whom we are obligated to bring back, and our heroes who fell in defense of the homeland and the nation. Away from the memorial sites, the war went on without a break. Israeli defense forces bombed Gaza, called upon residents to leave northern Gaza and move to the southern humanitarian zone where one million people have taken shelter. Tel Aviv claims the action in Gaza is to prevent Hamas from regrouping. Hamas too launched counter-attacks using rockets. On the northern front, Hezbollah launched scores of rockets at targets in northern Israel. At least 10 people were injured in the northern Israeli city of Haifa. The Hezbollah confirmed the attack, claiming they had bombed a gathering of Israeli soldiers. The rockets also hit civilian areas, as India Today's team found out in Haifa. That's the school, um, the damaged door, debris all around. Fortunately, there were no children present uh, in school uh, at midnight or close to midnight when the blast took place. Meanwhile, IDF warplanes pounded locations in southern Lebanon, including the Beka Valley. India Today reporters in Beirut suburbs, which bore the brunt of attacks last week, saw a trail of destruction. Many have moved out of vulnerable areas looking for safe zones. When the Israel Air Force carried out strikes in the southern Beirut, many rendered homeless. Their houses were destroyed and many out of fear left their houses and now taking refuse on the road and worst victim are the women and the children as now they have no idea where to go there are no homes there is no life there is no future and it's all under concern and dilemma when the situation will calm down Hamas is crippled Hezbollah leadership virtually wiped out but a year since the war broke out one of Israel's primary aims that is freeing all hostages is yet to be a reality and Tel Aviv probably has set new objectives after the Iranian missile attack. Israel's counter strike on Iran and what shape it will take has put the world on tenterhooks. With Gaurav Savant in Israel and Ashutosh Mishra and Ashraf Wani in Lebanon, Bureau Report, India Today. And my first guest is a special one. Uh, Ehud Olmert is former Israeli Prime Minister, someone who was in charge when uh, Israel led a 
invasion of Lebanon in 2006. I appreciate you joining us, Mr. Olmert. We are exactly one year on from that horrific terror attack of Hamas in Israel. One year later, what do we find? An escalating conflict that has claimed thousands of lives. Put in your words how you see the last one year. Has it now reached a point of no return, this conflict in West Asia? No, I think that uh, this has been a terrible year, no doubt, uh, primarily for Israel and for thousands of Israelis that were butchered and uh, raped and uh, killed in the most uh, terrible manner, and uh, subsequently for many other parts of the country, and then, of course, also to many thousands of Palestinians living in Gaza, uh, in the areas where uh, Hamas uh, is uh, in control, and uh, Hamas in purpose used the uh, civilians in Gaza as a human shield in order to protect themselves from the Israeli counteroffensive. Uh, this has been a very difficult, a very painful, uh, a very bloody year. I think it's time to end it. And uh, my first uh, expectation is that Israel will decide to stop the war in Gaza. Uh, we uh, have uh, broken down the uh, uh, Hamas military power. Mm -hmm. uh, we destroyed most of the tunnels underground Gaza mm -hmm. and uh, killed uh, most of its uh, uh, fighters. And uh, there is so much that you can achieve in a military operation. At this point now, as you have mentioned, there are 101 Israelis who are still held uh, by Hamas as hostages. And uh, if we need to stop the war in order to bring them back, then we have to do it. Now you're calling, Mr. Olmert, for a, for a cessation of hostilities on the very day when Israel has pounded Beirut, when Hezbollah has targeted Haifa, and when there is fear that there could be an escalating conflict involving Israel and Iran. Are you saying that it is even now possible to de-escalate, given that all indications, including what your Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu seems to suggest, is that this is a fight to the finish? You can only call for de-escalation when it's escalated. And uh, it, indeed, as you have mentioned, there are hundreds of rockets shot at uh, Israeli civilian centers from across the border in Lebanon which uh, requires an Israeli response by the Israeli Air Force in the uh, headquarters of uh, Hezbollah in the, the Dahlia uh, section of uh, Lebanon. But this is precisely the time where we have to hold on, all of us, uh, and to uh, uh, de-escalate what uh, appears to be escalating. Uh, just a few days ago, as you probably recall, the Iranians shot 200 ballistic missiles to uh, Israel. Sorry. There has never been in the history of modern times anywhere in the world such an attack of 200 ballistic missiles at the same time uh, moving forward with, uh, you know, 2,000 kilometers per hour or more uh, uh, right through to the state of Israel. Uh, thank God we were uh, skillful enough and uh, capable of enough of uh, intercepting them mm -hmm. together with our American friends and uh, European friends. But this is not something that can be tolerated. So, yes, I think that we have to stop the war in Gaza. We have to stop, hopefully, to reach an agreement about uh, Lebanon that will allow us to bring back the 80,000 Israelis which were vacated uh, out of their homes for the loss uh, for a whole year now mm -hmm. and uh, bring them back uh, if uh, the hostilities will uh, end in the, in the north. But most important, of course, uh, Iran has to be uh, stopped. No, how? Uh, let, 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 let's turn to that. You're saying ceasefire uh, in Gaza, which presumably means with the return of hostages. That's your presumably your expectation. Am I correct? You expect the hostages to be returned, in return for which there will be a stop to hostilities in all Gaza. Of the, all of the hostages in one phase. Right. And Israel has to stop the war and eventually, of course, pull out entirely from Gaza. 
uh, in the event that uh, security forces will step in instead of Israel, that will prevent any further attacks coming from Gaza. Okay. Towards so you're saying uh, almost simultaneously return of hostages that were taken one year ago and a cessation of hostilities in Gaza. But you said I Iran's actions cannot be tolerated. I read somewhere you suggesting that perhaps Iran's power installations need to be targeted. There are others who are talking about oil and military installations being targeted. How do you think Israel should and is likely to respond to Iran? Well, Israel has uh, enormous capacity, as you know, and you have witnessed it over the last uh, month and, and weeks uh, in every direction. Just a way, by the way, just an hour ago, there was a ballistic missile shot at uh, from Yemen by the Houthis to, uh, to, uh, into the state of Israel, uh, trying to target the uh, international airport at Ben Gurion, mm -hmm. and it was intercepted also. And this is all Iran. Iran is in uh, Yemen, Iran is in Syria, Iran is in Iraq, and Iran is in Lebanon. So the question is, what is the uh, priority of Iran? I didn't suggest that we will destroy. We can uh, attack the uh, nuclear capacity, the nuclear program of Iran. We can attack the uh, oil uh, headquarters of uh, Iran, uh, every part of Iran. I don't suggest this. I suggest that Israel will retaliate precisely the same way that the Iranians attacked us into military installations around Iran. But the question is, what is Iran after? Iran must know one thing. If they will continue the shooting at Israel, they will not face Israel only. They will face the United States of America and possibly also uh, European countries that will fight with Israel to defend the Western uh, countries against this Islamic fundamentalist, extremist, uncontrollable, uh, bloodthirsty uh, attitude. Uh, but, but, many, and, but many, Mr. Uh, Olmert, believe that this is exactly what Benjamin Netanyahu also wants. He wants a war with Iran because that will bring the United States in and that will actually widen the conflict. You're talking about de-escalation. Effectively, the moment Israel strikes on Iran, you're escalating the conflict and probably bringing the United States into it. <laughs> you have to be slightly, if you can, if you don't mind, to be slightly more accurate. First of all, as you know, I don't speak for Netanyahu and I don't speak for the Israeli government. Sure. I'm in opposition to Netanyahu and I'm in opposition to the yes. Israeli government. I believe most of the Israelis. But one can't ignore the fact that Iran started shooting ballistic missiles to Israel, first in April of uh, this year, mm -hmm. and now just uh, less than a week ago, uh, in, in a way that has to be answered somehow. And, and uh, uh, what I suggest is that the Israeli answer will be such mm -hmm. that it will not trigger an expansion of these hostilities. So the Iranians will have to understand that whatever they do, the fact is that they shot 200 ballistic missiles and there was not one Israeli hurt, personally, physically, okay? So they have to decide whether they want to continue this game, which may cost them a great deal more than it costed us up until now, particularly because they are going to face, as I said before, the United States right. and other together with Israel. So my desire is that this will end. It will allow us mm -hmm. to end the war in Gaza. It will allow us to end the conflict in the north. Hopefully, uh, if Hezbollah will understand that it has been very painful to them uh, in the last few weeks, and it can be even more painful, and it can be more disastrous to Lebanon, and we are not interested how, in it. How, how do you respond? destroying Lebanon. How do you respond, Mr. Prime Minister, uh, Mr. Olmer, to those who say that what Israel is doing, that's how the Palestinians and many, uh, the Arab street views it, is genocide. You're targeting civilians. You want to finish the Hezbollah. You want to finish Hamas in the process. Innocent civilians have died, thousands of them, disproportionate to what happened on October 7th. How do you respond to the charge that Israel is engaging in what the... Palestinians are saying is genocide and the killing of innocents. 
I'm sure that you don't say it because a sober person would never uh, voice this kind of outrageous accusations which have no basis in reality. Fact is that the Hamas started this operation and there was no way that we could uh, not respond to this. Uh, Hezbollah started the operation on the 8th of October last year without any provocation, without any reason. They say, Nasrallah said, before he was targeted, he said, the reason that we are fighting is because we want to fight against Israel because of the South, without any particular reason that they had to, uh, to justify uh, this kind of conflict between us and them. We are not interested in committing any crimes. And the fact is that although there were claims to the International Court of Justice arguing that Israel committed war crimes, it was not validated by the International Court of Justice. On the contrary, he didn't accuse any uh, Israeli action as trying to create uh, uh, war crime. And there is not any basis for these accusations. Yes. But, but, but yet, but yet, but yet, Mr. Olmert, there are Palestinians who say that this war didn't begin on October 7, 2023. It's been building up for years. They claim that they see Israel having occupied Gaza and West Bank, that they've treated Palestinians as effectively second class, that there are thousands of Palestinians in Israeli jails. There seems to be so much of animus on both sides. So when you talk of ending the conflict, how do you end the bitterness that exists? How is that going to ever end? Well, first of all, I subscribe to the statement opening your broadcast when you say exactly one year ago on the 7th of October 2023, a war started by the attack of the Hamas against the state of Israel, butchering and killing uh, more than 1,000 Israelis in the living rooms and in the bedrooms. So this is how it started. Now there is a long historical conflict between us and the Palestinians. The fact is that Israel pulled out from Gaza in 2005, and I had the privilege of being one of the main pushers as the vice prime minister at that time of doing it. Now, uh, I, I'm sure that you are aware of the fact that in 2008, I presented the Palestinians with a peace, comprehensive peace plan based on a two-state solution that unfortunately uh, the uh, president of the Palestinian Authority at that time didn't sign it and uh, he may have missed an opportunity, an historic opportunity, to have changed entirely the Middle East. Mm -hmm. Recently, as a few weeks ago, I issued a joint statement signed mm -hmm. together with the former uh, foreign minister of the Palestinian Authority and the former ambassador of the uh, Palestinians to the United Nations and the nephew of Yasser Arafat, a joint statement calling from the end, for the end of the war in Gaza and they uh, 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 offering a framework for peace between us and the Palestinians on a two-state solution. So what I am doing and what some Palestinians are prepared to do with me, which is remarkable and impressive. But, but, but are the people, offer a no, you know, what you're doing, you know, that's the question. Do the people of Israel and Palestine now are they, are they willing to have peace, given, as I said, what's happened in the last one year, the anger on both sides? Is there a peace there dividend is, out there? Are they ready for peace? There is, there is anger, obviously. How could it not be, uh, considering what happened, considering uh, how on the 7th of October 2023, uh, we were working up uh, to watch the uh, massacre of thousands of Israelis in the bedrooms, by uh, savage Palestinians coming from across the border. But the, the ultimate responsibility of uh, leadership is to try and change things mm -hmm. and not to surrender to emotions of uh, hate and to uh, the desire to avenge mm -hmm. when a, perhaps a different direction can be adopted. And what we are trying to do is to say to the Israelis and hopefully uh, to the Palestinians, but of course this is something that uh, a Palestinian leader such as uh, uh, Nasser al-Kidwa uh, will be able to do, is to say, look, at the end of the day, there is no other solution than a political compromise that will allow the establishment of a Palestinian state alongside the state of Israel that will provide the Palestinians 
with an opportunity to entertain their rights for self-determination as they have never done before. Okay. This is, I yeah. support, this is what I'm working for, this is what I'm preaching for, this is what I'm saying up front across the world, and I hope, together with a colleague from the Palestinian side, and we hope that this will ultimately right. capture the attention of the international community to help move it forward. Well, that is the long-term objective, surely, a political solution. But in the short term, we're seeing now Israeli forces on the ground in Lebanon. Last time when you were prime minister, Israeli forces were there in Lebanon in 2006, and the operation was not entirely successful. My point is, you're talking of the long-term political uh, solution, which is surely the way forward. But in the short term, do you only see now further escalation, further bombings, more violence, more killings? Is that inevitable? Israel seems to have opened or uh, their, their adversaries have opened a multi-front war. Is that something that troubles you if Israeli forces are on the ground in Lebanon, if they strike at Iran, if the Houthis also get involved from Yemen, if Syria also gets involved? Is that your worry that in the short term we could have an escalating conflict that consumes the entire Middle East? You have to decide where the uh, multi-front war starts and how it can be stopped. You are claiming that Israeli forces are in Lebanon. Israeli forces were holding up for more than a year when the Lebanese were shooting at us, the Hezbollah, and forced out 80,000 of the Israelis living in the north mm -hmm. away from their homes and were shooting on day in, day out, every day, 200, 300 rockets into every part of uh, the north uh, section of Israel, forcing more than a million people to live in the shelters mm -hmm. because of the danger to their lives. So at some point, something had to be done. And what happened in, uh, in the last few days is a result of this endless, continuous, uh, atrocious attacks by Hezbollah, and the same goes for the Houthis, and the same goes for the Iranian militias in Syria. We didn't, so, uh, we so, didn't know that the Houthis exist until sure. they started to shoot ballistic missiles at us. So, what we want to do now is very simple. Mm -hmm. Israel, my Israel, okay? I don't speak for the government. Mm -hmm. I don't speak for the prime minister. They don't like me. And I'll tell you something, I don't like them, okay? What I suggest, is that we will stop immediately the war in Gaza in order to bring back all the hostages simultaneously in one phase. I suggest that the American and the French efforts to broker a deal between us and the government of Lebanon will bring an end to the war in Lebanon, and that will probably quieten down the Iranians, at least for the time being. If the Iranians will insist on continuing their hostilities in spite of what I suggest, Right. as an ending of the war in the south and ending the war in the north, then they will have to fight not just with Israel, but also with America. And I'm not sure that this is going to be very, very uh, helpful to the Iranians. Well, Mr. Ehud Olmert, for speaking your mind out um, I, and, and your voice in a manner that perhaps hopefully uh, will echo across the Middle East, that the, this is a moment for peace. India, also in India. We and want all... very much Prime Minister Modi. I want very much Prime Minister Modi. Modi is a great leader and a very important uh, international uh, leader. And uh, we expect him and we want him to support what I propose and Mr. El Kidwa propose. There is an end to the war, embarking on negotiations, a two-state solution with a very, very intense support of, the, uh, of India. India is an enormously important, highly regarded country here, and the leadership of India right. is friendly to us as well as to the Palestinians, so they can play an important role in this process. Ehud Olmert, for joining me there from Tel Aviv, appreciate your joining us. Stay safe. Thanks very much for joining me Thank here you. and speaking your mind out. So we've heard from a major voice in Israel. I now want to turn to the Palestinian perspective, and I'm joined by Susan Abul Hawa. She's an internationally renowned and award-winning Palestinian author and poet. She joined me, I recall, almost a year ago, and that had gone viral, Miss Abul Hawa. So <clears throat> thank you very much for joining me from London at the moment. Would you concede, Susan Abul Hawa, at the very outset, 
a year after October 7, the roots of what has happened since then, the war in the Middle East, lie in what happened on October 7, 2023, the terror attack by Hamas on innocent Israeli civilians. No, I don't concede that. That's not the root cause uh, by in any way. Um, <clears throat> just like the root cause of... Uh, 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 the, the, the mass lynchings of, of enslaved people was not because Nat Turner rebelled. Um, the October 7th was a Palestinian uh, revolt. It was a rebellion. Um, it was primarily a military oper operation that targeted uh, Israeli soldiers. Mm -hmm. To date, we actually don't know what happened on October 7th because there has not been an investigation. But what we do know is that... 28 Israeli Apache helicopters emptied all of their rounds, all of their munitions on that day, and killing at least hundreds of their own citizens, according to Israeli media, Ms. according to Hamas, and reloaded at least once. The firepower of, uh, of, of those Apache helicopters is responsible for the scorched, for the burning, for all the burned cars and all the burned homes. We know that for a fact as well. Ms. We Abu also Lawa, know that Israel th made up spectacular lies, all of which uh, were were debunked completely from beheaded babies, from gutted uh, pregnant mothers, um, burned babies, the ovens, all these, uh, the, uh, the mass rape. All of these have been debunked lies. So these are the Ms. these are the facts that we no, know. No, no, Miss Miss Abu Lawa, and, I'm, um, I'm, I'm, so until somebody can actually until there is an investigation. No, no, no Miss Abu Lawa, I'm sorry that I'm interrupting you because there are those who are going to listen to you saying you're actually you know you're simply not accepting the reality of what happened on October seventh, two thousand and twenty-three, and not condemning it unequivocally. The fact is, innocent Israelis died on October seventh. The truth of the matter is that this was a terror attack by Hamas. You come today and call it a military operation, which was a terror attack on civilians. And over 100 Israelis, even now as we speak, are still held hostage and still with Hamas, ma'am. There are literally 9,600 Palestinian hostages in Israeli prisons. Not a single one of them has been charged with a crime or has stood trial. And they, in fact, are in torture camps. And what and what uh, Beth Salem has described as hell on earth, they are they are, they are being raped systematically. And we know this because now Israeli soldiers have admitted it. And you and you still insist on making us out to be the terrorists. It is extraordinary the way you lie, the way the media lies to the people is extraordinary. We are witnessing Ms. the Holocaust of our time, and you still want to begin the clock on October 7th. We have been slaughtered for 75 years, Rajdeep. No, 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 I will not no, allow no, no, you no, no, to no, start no, the clock. No, 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 for our survival. We are being wiped off the map. Man. We have been brutalized for 75 years. The num the 1200, we have been killed in far greater numbers consistently and continuously for 75 years. But you Susan. don't take notice. You don't report that's... it because our lives don't matter. No, that's not true, Susan. I am very clear. Every life matters, whether Israeli or Palestinian or any innocent life who's subject to a terror attack. I'm asking you to tell me how you see October 7 now in hindsight a year later, given that this targeted attack in Israel has now led to thousands of Palestinians being killed in Gaza and beyond, and now we are seeing it in Beirut as well. Put it in some context for us now. What I said is that the clock did not stop Start on October 7th and I will not allow any framing to suggest that it did when we have been slaughtered in far greater numbers continuously uninterruptedly for 75 years we have been slaughtered we have pressed our homes are demolished regularly we are humiliated on a daily basis our farms 
Our livelihoods are taken away. Our water is sucked out from underneath us, given to Israelis just nearly free and sold back to us at exorbitant prices. We go thirsty while they swim in swimming pools. We are we, we have roads that we cannot go down because they are for Jews only. This is a re, this is an extraordinary reality that has existed in the 21st century. It is an anach, it is a medieval anachronism that continues to persist in the world. And you still want to call us the terrorists because we dare to resist? I will not allow you to frame it that I, way. Ma'am, what you? It is dishonest. And your viewers Susan Abu Lawa. to see the reality of what's happening and what has happened to us. Ma'am, you use the word resistance more than once. Distinguish for me and for my audience what you call resistance and what they will see as terrorism. Because it's not just them. The world saw what happened on October 7, 2023 as an unprovoked terror attack. You're saying it was a part of resistance going back in time over decades. But the fact is, as a result, close to 40,000 innocent Palestinians have also died in what followed. And therefore, one wonders, where, where will all of this end, ma'am? Where will this end, Susan Abu Lawa, if there is so much of anger on both sides? It's just the West and... Uh, and and, uh, and 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 colonial mindsets like the India Times, who describe it as terrorism. As a matter of fact, the vast majority of the global South does not consider it terrorism, and they and they see it for what it is. Now, here's the thing: Do you know who Nat Turner is? No, tell me. Nat Turner was an enslaved African in the United States. He led a, resu- a revolt of enslaved of enslaved people in the United States. And he, he had lived his entire life as a slave to white, uh, to, to white plantation owners. And when they revolted, they went into the big house and they killed everybody. They killed the men and the women and the children. They killed everybody. Now, I can have compassion, true compassion for the women and children who were killed in the big house on the plantation. But I will always, always root for Nat Turner and the people with him because I know who the true victims are. Now, while I can have compassion for people who, uh, who were killed on that day, I will always root for people who have lived under Israel's boot for so long Susan. to fight back in whatever way they can. Now, by virtue of age, every single person at that Nova Festival was either an active duty or a reservist in the military. So you can consider them civil if you want. That's but the not fact true. is they are actually part of the military. I'm not saying they need they deserve to be killed. I'm not saying that. But to pretend that they are just these innocent uh, victims who came out and they are colonizers. They are colonizers who are having a party outside of a concentration camp where people cannot leave, where people whose whose dietary intake is is uh, is controlled by Israel, whose electricity, whose water is uh, is is controlled and denied. So, and and these are also the people who go on the hilltops and used to watch every time and eat popcorn like it's a movie every time Israel would bomb Gaza. So let's not pretend that these that these uh, uh, kibbutzes on the outskirts of Gaza were Susan. anything but colonies uh, populated by foreign colonizers. And the people in Gaza are actually the original inhabitants of those villages. Susan, so we... you have to provide that context as well. OK, I, I'm happy to provide the context as you see it, but we can agree to disagree, therefore, on what happened exactly a year ago this day. Let me talk about today. October 7, 2024. What are we seeing? Large parts of Gaza continue to be bombed. Palestinians claim more than 41,000 people have been killed. The world is seeing the catastrophe unfolding that could now take in Beirut. It could take in Iran, possibly. Offer me, therefore, a solution now that goes beyond the stated positions of Israel and Palestine, a solution that would end this war and the bloodletting. This war could have ended on October the 9th. Hamas literally told Israel that 
they would return all the hostages mm -hmm. in exchange for Palestinian hostages. It could have ended. And there were, multi and there were multiple uh, agreements where Hamas agreed to complete cessation of hostilities, return of all the hostages in exchange for ending the, uh, uh, ending the, the bombing campaign and uh, return of Palestinian Jews. That's it. It could have ended, but Israel doesn't want to end it. And you have to, and, and again, you know, it's, 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 it's extraordinary the way you frame things, even like talking about the dead and injured as, as Palestinians claims. It is, that is actually a, a, a significant underestimation, actually. Every single one of those names has been confirmed, have been announced, their ages and their ID numbers. So it's not a claim. It's actually an underestimation. There, there are at least, by, by most estimates, at least 350,000 people murdered in the span of one year. So, you know, and now Israel uh, is bombing Lebanon. And we all know why. And they're telling us why. They're telling us why. They want to expand because they think this is God's promise. And they lit there was literally a headline in the Jerusalem Post, which they've since deleted, that says, uh, basically suggesting that Lebanon is part of God's promised land for them. That, you know, 3,000 years ago now, it's theirs. And they're, they, you know, they're announcing, Susan, they're, they're, they're announcing has... new villages. They're, they're literally selling real estate in Lebanon. This is their goal. It's an expansionist Israel enterprise. has been bombed by the Hezbollah enterprise. from Lebanon. It's so sad, and I've said this to you before, Rajdi, that India does not recognize colonizers anymore. I don't know what happened to you. It hurts my heart. It really hurts my heart to see what India has become. It really does. You and don't even, you don't recognize colonizers. You don't recognize the victims. You're saying you're the victims and Israel are the colonizers. Just to say India's official stand has been that the hostilities must end at the earliest. That's the stand India has taken. I ask you again, therefore, given what has happened in the last one year, do you see any light at the end of the tunnel, Susan? Now, okay, I, I'll answer that, but, but we, you have to acknowledge first that one side has agreed, whether it's Hezbollah, the Houthis, Iran, pa Hamas, every single one of them has agreed to lay down their arms if Israel would stop. But there's only one side that's refusing to stop. No, no, and you must acknowledge that. What, 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 both sides have their, have their narratives on who's willing to end the war, but Israel says return of the 102 hostages held by Hamas is a precondition almost to a, for any kind of ceasefire. The first step must be the return of the hostages who were taken in on the, exactly a year ago. Do you accept that that's where you start? Is that the first step to be taken? Is, isn't that the acceptable way forward? That's not how it works. That's not how it works. You know, there was an agreement. There was a, there was a Security Council resolution. It's a binding resolution from the Security Council that lays out the terms. And, the, and Israel is the only party that has defied that and rejected it. It's literally the only one. Everyone else has agreed to it. Everyone else has agreed to a uh, to to an initial ceasefire that would allow for a progressive return of all of the hostages, including a withdrawal of Israeli troops from Gaza. That was agreed to. Israel uh, Israel reneged and yeah. Israel continued bombing because Israel does not want to stop bombing. You're saying Israel does not want to stop bombing. Israel is a colonizer. It's the oppressor. You're the victims. Israel, in turn, says whatever they're doing, even now, is in pure self-defense. It's a sovereign country surrounded by hostile neighbors, well-armed with terror groups, armed militias operating in each of these countries with impunity, directing and targeting Israel with bombs. Therefore, they say we are doing it in self-defense. Your response? Oh, please. Of course they say that. Every, every single colonizer says that. They're always... Every colonizer who steals and rapes and murders systematically and uh, will always say we're defending ourselves against the savages because they dare to fight back. Ev without exception, this is a very old script and you should know it, Najib. However, to, to that claim that they are in a bad neighborhood surrounded by hostile, I will tell you what, what, the, uh, uh, what the Jordanian foreign minister said uh, to that. He said, he said, I want to clarify something. Every single Arab 
Arab country in the region, including Iran, every single one of them without a single exception has said uh, since at least the year 2000 for 25 years and longer have said, we are willing to normalize economic and political and social and academic relationships with Israel and integrate them into the region. The only thing they ask is that Israel respect international law and end the occupation. That's it. So this idea that they are surrounded by these crazy uh, hostile Arabs is just a bunch of racism. It's just a bunch of white supremacist nonsense that you, again, should recognize. No, no, I, it's but the idea you know, what, that we, why... all we want is just we sit around and then just think about how to kill Jews. This is nonsense. It no, is but nonsense. That is... But but Susan, none of what you're saying is going to actually how do you know is going to actually re, uh, give us a resolution. Do you see light at the end of the tunnel, or will things get worse? You fear before they get better, given the animosities on both sides. I I don't I'm not a I'm not a psychic. I don't know what the future holds, but I can tell you what the immediate future holds. I I should say, but but in the long term. I can tell you that Israel will not exist in its current form. It will not exist because this kind of white supremacist, this overt uh, apartheid system of multi-tiered laws uh, and codified racism that apply, that privilege Jews at the expense of non-Jews, this endless sort of a uh, uh, notion uh, that God loves them more, that they are somehow, I mean, how many times have we seen this in history to know that this is not sustainable and this will not, this will not continue to thrive and it should not be allowed to continue to thrive in, in the world. We need an equitable world. We need an end to this colonialism, this idea that some people are better than others. We need to live, our planet is burning. We are destroying. We are destroying our vegetation, our animals, our wildlife, because Ms. because this small Susan. group of people cannot get enough. Because nothing is ever enough for this small group of people who have all the money, all the power. That's that's I'm, why we are in this. And, I, and, and at the center of this is Israel. No, I'm I'm going to ask you one last time, and there are those who react, who will listen to you today and say. There's a lot of anger in what Susan is saying, lots of strong words being used, but the evidence on the ground suggests that there are simply no angels out there in this war. There have been war crimes committed on both sides. There have been terror attacks. There has been the killing of innocents. And therefore, the first step towards reconciliation, Susan Abolwa, is acknowledging that this is the reality on the ground. You cannot live in denial that there has been hate, which has been led to violence on both sides of the divide. No, I reject this two-sidism. And this is the problem why people like you keep framing it like it's two sides. Like there were two sides to slavery. Like there were two sides to British colonialism of India. Like there were two sides to apartheid South Africa. This is not two sides. This is a situation of colonialism, of enormous oppression and theft and degradation of one people at the hands of another people while the colonized are fighting back. You have to you have to make this clear to people because it's 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 dishonest otherwise. So that is the evidence. So you cannot say the evidence is otherwise. That is the evidence, and that's the truth, and that's the historic record. Now, the end to this, again, the end to this will be an end to a, to colonialism. Okay. And an end to a, this apartheid system. Palestinians and Arabs on the whole have already expressed a willingness to exist alongside Israel, but we will never accept them as our masters. And they can't seem to understand this. Let me leave it there, Susan Abulawa. You've spoken with great passion. Whether that passion alone is enough to bridge a divide between people, and the fact is that thousands of people have died in the last one year, and there's no end at the moment to the war in West Asia. But to, for speaking to me and taking the time out, Susan Abulawa, thank you very much for joining me on the show tonight. As you heard, two very different perspectives. The former Israeli Prime Minister who's calling for peace and Susan Abulawa who's calling it Israeli colonialism.
and aggression. Nearly 60 days since taking over the RG car rape and murder horror in Kolkata, the CBI filed their first charge sheet in the case. And the big news, the jailed accused Sanjoy Roy has been named as the lone rapist and murderer. The CBI ruled out gang rape in the horrific crime. They claimed that Roy was inebriated when he committed the horrific act. Bengal's junior doctors, meanwhile, remain on the warpath against the Mamta Banerjee government. Take a look. 56 days after the CBI took over the Abhaya rape and murder horror probe, the investigating agency has filed a charge sheet against the main accused, Sanjoy Roy, in a special court in Kolkata. The charge sheet does not include gang rape charges, suggesting that Roy acted alone. Statements of about 200 people have been recorded in the charge sheet that names Roy as the main accused. Roy allegedly confessed to the crime after being arrested on August 10. He later made a U-turn claiming he was being framed. Doctors who have been protesting for two months are now on a hunger strike. जो चीजें मांग रहे हैं वो सिर्फ अपने लिए नहीं वो इस पूरे बंगाल के लोगों के लिए है इनको मद्देनजर रखते हुए ये पता हो जाना चाहिए सरकार को कि हंगर स्ट्राइक एक ऐसा फॉर्म है जिसमें इंसान अपने आप अपना जान को दाव पे लगाता है थोड़ा सिंपैथी के नजर से इस चीज को देखे और हमारे मांगे पूरी कर ले डॉक्टर्स आर डिमांडिंग जस्टिस इन द आरजी कोर्ट केस एंड एनहांस सिक्योरिटी फॉर डॉक्टर्स मूल उद्देश्य है हमारे डिमांड्स के सबसे पहला डिमांड जस्टिस फॉर अभया मतलब अभया को इंसाफ मिलना चाहिए जल्द से जल्द मिलना चाहिए इसमें सीबीआई का जो रोल है सेशंस कोर्ट में वो बहुत ही ढीला है हम चाहते हैं कि सीबीआई सकारात्मक रूप से सामने आए जल्द से जल्द चार्जशीट चार्जशीट फाइल करे किसी भी व्यक्ति को साल दो साल ना लगे इंसाफ पाने के लिए the doctors are mounting pressure on the Mamata Banerjee government that had promised immediate action on better working conditions for the medics. Nearly two months since Abhaya's heinous rape and murder, the fight for justice for her family and doctors continued. Bureau Report, India Today.